Hello and welcome everyone to a Palazzo Fantasy Baseball podcast. Two L's, two Z's. I'm your host, Britton Allen. And today I am honored, thrilled, and utterly excited to have a very special guest. I'm talking about a man who is the creator of a little teeny tiny website you might have heard about called Picture List, a brilliant website dedicated to all things fantasy baseball, including tools that help people and experts in their fantasy baseball drafts called things like PLV. And you're like, wait a minute, what's PLV? I don't know what that is. I know what StatCast is. I know what hard hit percentages are. What is PLV? Oh, well, it's a trade secret, my friends. But much like when NASA declassified Velcro and WD-40, such is the way with Picture List and PLV. It is available to the public, but you must go to PictureList.com to check it out. And I strongly encourage everyone to do that. I am a subscriber to Picture List. I love it. It is a great website. So you're saying, well, who, who is this person? Well, when this guest is not busy with Pitcher List and PLV, he is being an actual good human being. And if you're like me, you are like, what is that? Well, a good human being... <laughs> Uh, he organizes and runs PitchCon, which is a charity event that I tune in every year. But it's a charity event where fantasy baseball analysts, and I mean the people, the Eno Saris, Paul Spore, Justin Mason, Derek Van Riper, uh, uh, countless others, and I don't mean to leave anybody out. They are all there. They all donate their time because this guest asked them to to live stream for days, I believe it's four, we'll confirm that in a minute, for four days to raise money for charity. Uh, 100% of donations uh, go to ALS Research, by the way, that is 100% of the donations. So you're like, wait a minute, who is this picture list good guy extraordinaire? All right, of course, you know who it is. It is Mr. Nick Pollock. What's up, Nick? I cannot believe I just sat three minutes through that and didn't interrupt you. That was unbelievable. Was that too that, much? That, that was <laughs> the most willpower I've given myself in a long time. You are too much, <laughs> Britain. And I got to say, the fact that I'm even here and trusting someone with two first names is something that I don't do, but I do it for you. I uh, that was that was unbelievably touching and so unnecessary. I am excited to be here, man. Two L's, two Z's, the Palazzo podcast. It's a great time every single time. And uh, it is actually five days this year, PitchCon. I haven't made that fully public, but we please, yes, we please tell us day. what's going on with PitchCon, <laughs> uh, what the days are, yeah. and let us know where it is because I love it. It is, like I said, a live stream event. So you can check in when you have a minute from work or, you know, whatever it is you're doing and listen to all the panelists. But please, I mean, uh, please tell those uh, the the listeners what, what, what the deal is with PitchCon. It's really hard to do that, Bryn, because I see this wonderful image underneath me. I'm trying to, like, dissect all the things like it's uh, it's like an I spy book of just every little element is so well placed. <laughs> and I want to just understand all of it. Oh, my God. Uh, it is fantastic. And also the most important ones in the top top left corner. Go rate this episode and, of course, this podcast. Five stars on Apple and Spotify. Go subscribe. Absolutely do that if you haven't yet. Um, PitchCon is a charity event for ALS to combat the, the terrible, terrible disease. 100% of it goes to uh, research and we're hoping to raise $10,000. That's our goal every year. Um, we are going to do it for five days this year instead of four, starting on Wednesday, January 24th through Sunday, January 28th. I usually don't do it on the Sunday because I know people want to watch a stupid game. Uh, mm, I've playoffs heard or something instead. And I said, you know what? I don't care. There are too many people I want to 
be a part of it this year. Um, and uh, what's really interesting about this year is that in the past, yeah, we, it's been more of that fantasy baseball panels. Um, it's a lot wider now. A lot of people I know inside the baseball world who have nothing to do with fantasy are going to be involved. There is one stupid, ridiculous guest that I should never have been able to get that I technically have. He does have an out. Um, and I hope it doesn't happen, but he said like, Hey, if there's like some crazy condition I need to go. I have to flag him. Like, that's totally understandable, sir. Like um, the green, like the green M and M's only and Jennifer Lopez's, uh, uh, room. Yeah. Right. To make sure like they that read crazy the writer at the end of their entertainment contract. Yeah. Right. Just to make sure that they read it. You know, that that's what the whole thing was. Um, but I, but yeah, no, it's going to be a fantastic event. 55 hours live streamed from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern time, um, Monday through Sunday at pitchless.com slash pitchcon. Really easy to do it. You can also just go directly on uh, playback.tv slash pitcherless. That's where we're going to be live streaming. We're going to have the chat the entire time. And yeah, uh, donate whatever you can. You don't have to. Um, there are also prizes to win uh, that are completely available to everybody, regardless of if you donate or not. And uh, you definitely want to be there at least for that. Um, but it's going to be a great time. And I really am just so thankful for the entire community. It's, it's such a cool thing that we do. Uh, and we all enjoy it. I mean, we just get to sit around and talk about our favorite thing. Um, and I'm just really honored that I get to be someone that hosts something like that. So, uh, yeah, we're really stoked about it. And it's a week away, you know, Wednesday, January 24th, 11 a.m. Eastern time at pitchless.com slash pitchgun. It's a great event. I tune in every year. I love it. And please go to pitcherlist.com and it'll lay out for you who the speakers are, who, who the panelists are, what the prizes are, and all things you can sign up for. So go to pitcherlist.com to check it out. And I forgot to mention, like uh, Nick said, it's free. Like, yeah, obviously, you don't, free. you don't have to, yeah, you don't have to donate if you don't, you know, if you, know, if you can't totally totally get it uh, i totally understand but if you want to you can and uh you can watch a bunch of people talk about fantasy baseball because nick it is my favorite time of year pretty good it, uh, hope springs eternal alexander pope uh <laughs> once wrote we're drafting we're drafting every team i draft is the best team that's ever <laughs> been drafted oh, in the history of fantasy baseball I love drafting uh, this time of year because it helps tide me over, obviously, until spring training comes around. And it's not mm -hmm. that far off. It's, you know, 30 days or so. But um, we're I asked, there. yeah, we're getting there. It's chugging, chugging along. Of course, <laughs> we're up right in the middle of a blizzard, Nick. I'm, oh, man. You know, I, I, I don't know your situation, but I live in Nashville and it looks you like you live in school. Nashville. Okay. So I live in, a friend of mine is staying with me. And he's from Nashville. He's been giving me updates about like snow in Nashville and how ridiculous this is. Uh, it's uh, not. It's, it's like I look outside and it's Iceland, and I'm like, "Where are these gnomes? Uh, at? What's <laughs> happening over here?" Oh, I don't that's know. wild, man. Um, yeah, I'm in Brooklyn, and uh, we just got a touch of snow—the first snow in like 700 days. Um, and uh, I don't want it. I, I'm the curmudgeon here, who says, "You know what? No, I I want one snowfall. I want it to be nice, and then I want it to be cleaned and gone. I I hate it when it snows in New York." Because I City don't want life. to walk slower. I have yeah. to make sure I don't fall because it's all icy and everything. We all have to walk in like a single file line because we only have like one path carved out. <laughs> and I don't I don't move like that. I'm 6'4". I got those long legs. I got places to be. Yeah. And I can't even cross the roads differently. I have to go exactly to the crosswalk and then wait for the people to come across it. Because again, one path. I hate it. I don't want it. And it's gorgeous. The uh, blizzard is so nice. And you go outside and you go to the park. Prospect Park is so beautiful and everything. Yeah, I don't want it anymore. So I'm sorry that you have snow in Nashville. You got to deal with it. But Nashville's not set up for snow like New York or, in, or anywhere. It's it, there in the entire, you know, Davidson County. There's one snow plow, hmm. you know, like for, for everything. And they break it out once a year and they they wake up the guy who's you know asleep in the lunchroom like hey hey it's mr plow the what other day things, mr actually. yeah I don't know he's like one. the guy from jaws that hunts that all he does is hunt the sharks like that guy like quinn or whatever like hey sure. go, go go get the snow plow but 
uh, the, it's 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 all good. Um, but I I, I kind of like the snow. We didn't have any snow for Christmas, so it's kind of nice to see a little bit of snow outside. There you but go. Uh, nice. Anyway, anyway for right. Me. Anyway, enough about my weather situation, which I'm sure no one cares, but. <laughs> Uh, one of the great reasons of having Nick Pollock on a podcast is to talk about pitching. And um, I know we can, we know how great Garrett Cole is and, you know, Spencer Strider, apparently he throws, he throws the ball hard and makes it spin, you know, all that kind of like technical stuff that I like to throw out there, you know, (laughs) but the players that uh, I was going to ask about are some of the players that are, a little bit later on in drafts, not, you know, crazy late, but a little bit later past uh, ADP of about 200 or so. And a couple players I wanted to ask you about, because there's one, there's one pitcher that's been kind of, kind of like simmer sauce. He's, he's simmering. His name's kind of getting out there. He's he's under the radar a little bit. Uh, His name is Christopher Sanchez. for Phillies. that's not fair. Like, it's not fair, Bryn. I rem- no. I haven't actually really done my NFBC ADP. Who do I really like yet? It's kind of weird. I do it in like October, November. I'm like right there with it. And then December somehow just completely removes all my memory. Oh. And as I do my rotation pieces of as, as I have through the year, which is pretty much my preparation of creating that stupid long top 300 article, I I go through every single team. And I actually hadn't done my Christopher Sanchez real dive yet until Sunday. It wasn't like literally like two days ago. I did this and, and and I I was looking into Christopher Sanchez expecting like, I remember as the season was going on, I was thinking, okay, this is Ranger Suarez 2.0, good schedule and a changeup guy, good locations and everything. And like, he's just in a rhythm. This is going to be overdrafted next year. Okay. Well, the thing is, Ranger Suarez was drafted like what 170 or something in the year after. Yep. And then I said, like, where is Christopher Sanchez going now? And I saw it was like 250. And I that doesn't make sense to me. Christopher Sanchez to me, uh, well, there's a couple interesting things that makes him different than Ranger Suarez. One, his horizontal movement on his sinker is really good. Like it's elite level. He doesn't actually use it as I think he should, which is another story. He stays away from from lefties i think he shouldn't he should absolutely just throw that inside and demolish them but the changeup is more elite than anything that ranger suarez has and it mirrors the sinker so well that he's able to steal called strikes against righties and then many ways sinkers wouldn't if you have that change up then it freezes them a lot more um it's kind of how like logan webb gets his called strikes on his sinker because he has such a good change up underneath it too and he is so efficient he's actually we, we were we've been toying around with so many different plv stats under the hood. If you don't know PLV, it's it's like Stuff Plus. It's a pitch model, um, quantifier like pitching bot, that kind of thing. But instead of just making it about stuff, it actually incorporates command more. Um, so it's kind of like Pitching Plus, but individually for every single pitch. And if we, what's really cool for us, instead of doing it as a broad label of like this guy's slider is X, like he has a Stuff Plus of 110 or something, whatever. We don't really care about the broad label. We care about mm-hmm. it more of the individual pitch so that we can do greater calculations with it. So, for example, we can say things like, hey, this changeup is thrown as a mistake more often than others because we can see that it's a lower PLV than others uh, that he's thrown, which is really cool. We can actually get some cool variant stuff. We can do analysis of how often they throw changeups that or whatever pitch that allows more home runs like that is going to replace for us Homer per nine and Homer fly ball rate. Like how how many it's, pitches do you throow that allow next level? Percentage? Yeah, well, it's 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 the intuitive level, though. It's like you see guys like, oh, yeah, well, he threw a hanger and the guy crushed it, you know, or he didn't crush it. And you want to know that as opposed to just kind of grading all fly balls equal or just you know, home park or whatever it is. We can just say how many pitches did this guy throw? Like, what is the total percentage of home runs that he's allowed? Like every single pitch has a three percent home run chance assigned to it or something like that. Right. right. Well, what's the total amount for all of his pitches versus someone else's? And how many expected home runs do we have because of that? That's really cool. So. Going back to this, um, we have one that we're messing around with. It's efficiency of like how many expected pitches uh, per out should this guy be throwing? And like just based on the quality of it, well, he get lots more hits. So then he shouldn't be getting as many outs or so. Chris Sanchez was like top 10 Whoa. <laughs> in efficiency. What? Yeah. I mean, if you even look at it last year, like he 
you go look at these games and he's throwing like 70 pitches to get through like six innings at times or 76 or something. And you go, wait, hold on. Why is that? Oh, right. Because the sinker just gets a lot of called strikes and his changeup is absolutely bonkers. It's like a 40% usage changeup to righties and had a 21% swing strike rate, if I remember correctly. Like, wait, that's really amazing. It's elite. So yeah. what I've realized kind of was Christopher Sanchez. And I'm still in your whole thing about why you like Christopher Sanchez, of course, but it's just so funny to me that like you mentioned him now. I, I kind of see him as like, you draft him and yeah, you're kind of like, this is fine the entire year, even like in a 12 teamer, you're like, you're fine with it. Um, now I don't know how good the slider is. The slider is a little underperforming in my view. And also he had a really comfortable schedule. And so some of those numbers might be seeing about the change of his effectiveness and the called strikes and the sinkers, you throw in better offenses, Maybe, you know, he gets a bit worse. But then again, he destroyed like the Atlanta for, I think, like 10 strikeouts with that changeup. And I was just like, well, that's pretty cool. Um, by the way, that was, that was the weakness of the of the of Atlanta last year with changeups. Any any guy that had like amazing changeups, the um, the Phillies actually figured that out, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah. He, well, he's yeah. an extreme ground baller, too, which works. Uh, yeah. He, he plays for the Phillies, which also uh, yeah, works. Yeah. Defense has gotten get, better. You're going to get run so, support. Like, we're cool with that. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to get run support. And I, I like the fact that you brought brought up Ranger Suarez because everybody kind of has that little aftertaste like, well, I, I believed in Suarez last year and look where that got me. You know, a four, six, you know, ERA. <laughs> got to let it go. Queen <laughs> Elsa. It's not him. Yeah, man. Like, just take the gloves off. Let it go. Move on. <laughs> oh, Ranger Suarez, man. If you had that change up, oh, that'd be different. But no, you don't. You don't have Christopher Sanchez's change up. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, Christopher Sanchez for the Phillies is a great buy at uh, 239 ADP, somewhere in that range, depending on who you draft with and everything else. But there's another guy I wanted to ask you about hmm. that I have uh, a, an infatuation for. I'm not 100% sure why. I'm pretty sure it's his name. <laughs> Reed Detmers for oh. the, uh, <laughs> the Angels. Reed Detmers. He sounds... He sounds like a guy that's like the son of a, you know, like the rich kid that, you know, growing up, like the son of like a heart surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or something like they all name their kids Reed for some reason. I don't know what rich people do, but so Reed Detmers flashed some brilliance, flashed some ugly, ugly ERA games. What what is PLV I uh, think and you think uh, Nick about Reed Detmers for the Angels? Well, I mean I don't know if you know me and Reed. Uh, two straight years in the spring, I got I got completely fooled by you, mm. uh, Reed. History. And I have this I have this bobblehead because I just felt it would be too. Oh big. yeah, look at that. Yes. Yeah. See, I didn't. I I did not know that. I, I'm not trying to bring up any kind of bad yeah. feelings. I mean, I also have Luis Castillo over here, so it's all right. Uh, but um, with Reed Detmers, so what's interesting is that PLV isn't – I'm not going to be the person that tells you, hey, guys, just like follow what PLV says and do that. I don't believe in that. Kyle doesn't believe in that. We like it as a nice um, – kind of a, an indication like, oh, cool, that's interesting. Why is that, right? And I, for me personally, I, I've considered PLV as that seed stat as opposed to the stat. Um, and again, that's going into how we're using it is not for that end all be all broad label. It's to then allow us to analyze individual moments better and say, look, that home run was hit off of a really good pitch. Thus, that hitter should be graded higher than someone else who hit a home run off of a really bad pitch. That makes all the sense intuitively. And it allows us to say, great, this guy's making good swing decisions because of the PLV that he's receiving and how he's reacting to those things. It's a seed stat, not a uh, not one that's just like you point out and say, great, cool. Uh, but PLV really does help with Reed Detmers <laughs> because it's just like, yeah, it's not that good. I was like, why isn't it this good? I mean, like there's four seamers upstairs and increase the velocity on it. Oh, it has terrible shape. And what that means, and I, I was really someone that um, I pushed back a little bit, which some, it sounds surprising as someone who's like so into pitching and everything. I was really hesitant to really jump into the whole um, pitch shape discussion because I didn't really have any reference point. I didn't feel like I got comfortable looking any of this stuff up and really grasping it quickly until, I mean, I know this is going to sound like a plug, but until Kyle made for me the PLV uh, pitches app, which allows you 
to individually look at every pitch and then see the qualities of it from like induced vertical break and in, in VAA and extension and velocity and also with the ranking bars saying like this is high, this is low. And that's when I started to actually get familiar with it. And I put out the thing for uh, for Vlad um, Sutler and the FTN um, fantasy guide kind of talking about like how to use our tools and metrics and stuff to get better information and includes like, hey, this is a guide to reading fastball shape. And really, it just kind of matters with fastball for the most part. I mean, you can look into it with like sliders and curves and stuff like that. And you can. I haven't really found it to be very valuable. It's really more valuable for uh, for fastball, four seams or specifically, really. And uh, with Detmers, you want to see like on a four seamer, you want to see like 16 vert. OK, like IVB, induced vertical break is what that stands for. Doesn't really matter. Just say like, hey, I want to see 16 inches. That means it's moving a lot. Up. that's good that's rise okay right and then with extension um when you see like six or under you know that it's making it worse and then when you see like above 6.5 if you get close to seven or even higher than that then it's like oh man that guy is getting so much extension that's him going off to home plate right uh and that's good stuff that's like freddie peralta and tyler glass now they are such good extension guys zach wheeler's four seamer believe it or not does not have high ivb because it's such good extension it's really good and uh, also VAA is just the, um, you're going to see on our thing, it's like one is like kind of like the baseline. If you're at like 1.2 or 1.5, then it's like, oh, that's what you love. That's the stuff that really just makes it so you throw high and it's good. It's very flat angle. And then like the, the point sevens, all that kind of stuff is steep and that's bad. What I'm trying to say is that Reed Detmers is fastball. Sure, it increased actually a tick of velo, but then it came down in swing strike rate. Why? Because it has terrible IV, uh, IVB, so it has terrible vertical break. Mm. He doesn't get enough extension at all, and he has a bad VAA. And all of the ways that we would treat a good fastball, yeah, he just doesn't have. So that's not good, and that's why you have those little swing strike rates, even with the the, the four seamer upstairs. And the other aspect is that the slider was really the big thing. It's like a nineteen percent swing strike rate last year on it. Um, that was what got me so excited about him in the first place because I thought he had this decent approach with the fastball curve and also in the slider gave him that whiff pitch. It's um, inconsistent. It's not really the uh, the offering we want it to be uh, when it comes to just, hey, cool, you throw the slider and everything's going to be fine. And it kind of breaks the Wasker rule, which is you have like one good slider and then other things aren't very good. Um, the other negative is that it's the Los Angeles Angels and they are just so bad at pitching development. They don't fix things. Actually, the one guy that fixed something for Reed Detmers was Buddy Carlisle, and they fired him. So that unfortunately has me out on Detmers right now, and I want to be back in, but I just can't do it. I uh, I totally uh, appreciate that. When you're talking about vert this and that, I was like, sounds like my blood alcohol content level on a on a Friday night. You know, all kinds of vert going up and down. Who knows? But. But Reed Detmers uh, is one of those pitchers, like when you watch him pitch, right, you, you know, right. I'm like, he's got it. He's got the stuff, but then it just needs to develop. And it sounds like, unfortunately, that the I Angels hope so. aren't yeah. the team to do it. But we'll keep our eye on Reed Detmers. Uh, there is another pitcher who I love. His name is Reese Olsen mm. for the Detroit Tigers. Reese Olsen. Which also reminds me, you know, I'm a simple man, Nick. I keep it real, real simple. Simple man doesn't have this at the bottom of his podcast. I'm just talking right now. Funny funny story. I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, After I recorded a video last time, Michael Govier uh, uh, texted me and he said, you know, we need to, you know, because I didn't have any of this stuff. And he was like, you know, we need to. Uh, and when he said we, he means me, <laughs> you know, you need to have the background and all that uh, stuff going on when you record these, you know, to keep up, you know, appearances. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I was like, this, this seems kind of busy to me, but you know, what, uh, what, what do I know? Maybe it's good for the clicks or something. I don't know. No, so, no, you gotta, you gotta keep the brand alive. He's it, right. Is, is that Absolutely it? I was like, right. I gotta, the, the last one I recorded, I took this mirror off over here mm-hmm. and then, so the, the hooks were in there and of course, you know, it was, it didn't look all that great, <laughs> but, um, uh, but so now I'm keeping, uh, emphasis off you know my personal background and then all this kind of stuff looks which you know looks like Wee's playhouse or something going on in here yeah, it looks I don't great know. all of it looks great 
Loving it. <laughs> but Reese, speaking of Michael Govier, shout out to him and to all the folks at Palazzo Podcast. Uh, and and the Detroit Tigers, his favorite team, the Detroit Lions, have uh, I know you don't well, like football, but the the Lions have made it into the the next round, the divisional round. Of oh, the they playoff. did. They did. They won. And I know that because I bet on uh, the Rams. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Reese Olson is a starting pitcher for the Tigers. He uh, debuted last year in and played well. Uh, his ERA was under four. His Second half was better than his first starts, but that he's a rookie. He's 24 years old, you know. But I really like him because, A, his name is Reese, which, as I said, I keep it simple. I'm a huge fan of the Reese's peanut butter cups. Mm. I mean, I could eat a delicious Reese's peanut butter cup. You know how this is a good dichotomy. You're talking about the vertical movement of the pitches, and I'm talking yeah. about Reese's peanut butter cups. There you go. How do you eat it? There's no wrong I way. eat it cold. I, I, I put the Reese's peanut God butter cups in the refrigerator. Yeah, okay. And then in the morning, I drink coffee. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if you're in a coffee. I'm, oh, I'm, I am, I'm, yeah. I'm addicted. I have a new Presso machine. I, I like every morning I get up and I like come downstairs and start it and I kind of like give it a hug. And mm -hmm. then I <laughs> and then I get a like a sweet bite, like a Reese's Pieces, and I have a little bite of the Reese's Pieces. So oh nice. Uh, so because of that, and that only. Am I rooting for Reese Olson of the Detroit Tigers at ADP 259? All right. I love Reese Olson. I love the Tigers in that big Comerica uh, <laughs> outfield pitchers park. It's so beautiful. Nobody, even Spencer Torkelson can't hit 30 home runs in that park, no matter <laughs> how many games he plays there. You know, it's just so big and beautiful. And I like uh, the Tigers coach, uh, uh, manager, excuse me. And and I like, uh, I like the up and coming team. Javier Baez is going to make some plays. Uh, you know, would, that's how I see it. Chocolate and peanut butter, marriage. Made in heaven, Reese Olson <laughs> in the Tigers, not as delicious, but also quite good. What What do you think, Nick, about Reese Olson for the Tigers? Well, I think he's uh, in an unfortunate situation being the SP6 right now. Oh, yeah, Jack Flaherty. Mm. They don't sign Jack Flaherty and not start him. You know, you know yeah. his ADP uh, is even later than uh, than Reese Olson for some. Oh reason. yeah, he is. Um, which we'll uh, talk about that too. I'm absolutely. Sure. Yeah, but, I'm 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 looking at I don't know how what you put off as a cutoff uh for uh for ADP. So I see results in like 278 right now. Mm. And I see I don't even see Jack Flaherty here. Uh Jack Flaherty's down to 413. What? Um and I uh, at least this is since like Jan 1st. Uh I do it also I I annoyingly go through and like label them as RPs cuz I just can't deal with that <laughs> and then i filter them out am i cool now I actually just get the actual starting pitchers because those are the ones that matter and how is bailey over 64th i don't know y'all are crazy how do you uh -huh. have 64 uh, that just makes no oh no 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 i take that back uh bailey over is at is no oh i have it filtered out okay you know what i gotta be better at this uh <laughs> anyway hi reese olsen i think he's really good I think he's a uh, sinker is good inside the right handers. The, the slider is amazing. It's a fantastic pitch. Um, he stays away to, uh, to right handers with, and he has the, the changeup to nullify left handers a decent amount. The biggest issue is, I think, left handers because the slider isn't as effective. Sinkers are generally just worse against off handed batters unless you are a front hip guy, which is very rare and difficult to do. Um, his four seamer is terrible. I mean, it's really just, no, don't throw this, Reese, please. And I, oh. he allowed a ton of damage on it last year. So that's going to be the biggest area of development for me. Can he be like that Carlos Carrasco type of slider change up there just so good and the fastball, the sinker is just good enough and that's okay? Or can he maybe take a step forward with the sinker, maybe learn a cutter that can maybe nullify riders, uh, sorry, left-handers more often? But the slider being as good as it is and having a change up that does need to be a little bit more consistent Um is a really good combination. And honestly, when you look at uh, a lot of pitchers, you can throw them into two buckets of like, most of them are going to be right-handers that are successful more than lefties when you're in the kind of like Toby land. And you're like, wait, why is that? It's because you generally are better against the same handedness. And 
if you're better against righties and lefties, you're going to be more valuable than those are better against lefties and righties because you're going to see more right-handed batters than left-handed batters. That's just kind of how it is. Now, sure. sometimes Toby's, uh, the, like those middling starters, those ones that you don't really want to touch and we don't really know if they're going to be any good. As If you're a lefty, you generally have then a good changeup. And if that's the case, then you might actually be able to get by Tyler Anderson uh, in 2022 with the Dodgers. So that can work out sometimes. But uh, yeah, Reese Olsen should be good when he gets it. I just don't want to go after it because I don't want to draft someone I'm stashing. I, I That is something I kind of did before a little bit. And every single year I realized, no, I need to have more intriguing options for now than stashing i'm i've it's the hardest thing you do as a fantasy player but i think the ones that are most successful are the guys that are not wasting bench spots and they're getting value now which is not even a burning hand worth two in the bush it's like five in the hand is worth two in the bush or whatever five in the bush one in the hand is with five in the bush that's what i mean guys okay that's Bur the one the, the, don't the, stash. The, the burning bush is like three amigos <laughs> How many bushes are are, are we, have, we we have going on here? We've got uh, we've got one giant podcast. one with five people in it, and then you <laughs> we just have got six one tigers hand. in a burning bush. Yeah, <laughs> and Reese Olson is uh, he doesn't get to go in the burning bush. I'm sorry, it's five five pitchers. But so Eduardo <laughs> Rodriguez, uh, they're paying Jack Flaherty 14 million, so obviously he's he's in there. Um, you know, I, I just I don't know why, but what. I just love the the kind of the, the way the Tigers are going because they also have you know Gibson Sawyer Long like they well yeah he's number he's, seven to me he's number seven right yeah, so. and then there's number eight which is Jackson Job oh! yes I mean obviously you could say like Casey Mize is he actually going to get that rotation spot yes they're going to give it to Casey Mize guys that, yeah. that's that's going to happen so yeah man Casey I, Mize he was like the first overall pick back in the I day, know right? he's an interesting one because he was a sinker focused guy and honestly. It's rare for me to see prospect pitchers that I'm excited about that are sinker focused anymore. It's become so clear to me that like guys that excel as a prospect are, yeah, you have to have a four seamer that does really well. Otherwise, you better have at least two secondaries that are just studly and then we're okay. But if you're just trying to do a sinker and a sinker and like one other pitch, it's like, no, Gavin Stone, I don't want to touch you. Um, yeah. Either a four seamer, that's not fair. Um, but that was change of focus, and it still bothers me immensely. That it was change of focus. God, wait, Jackson Job is legit, and I yeah. can't wait for that one. Did, yeah. did you see him out at the Arizona Fall League? Was was uh, was he pitching out? Uh, in, oh, I don't in, know. Uh, was Job there? I thought so. I could be wrong. I mean, I I trust you guys. I I don't do well scouting from the seats. Uh, actually, I remember talking to a scout about this who's so trained about it, and like he's like, "Yeah, this is how I see things." I'm like, "I can't do this." But I get well. Like, you're trained to this. I'm trained behind the, behind the pitcher. Right. Uh, you just see so much more there. Um, but yeah, didn't see him. It, it, it's pretty exciting for the Tigers. They're a team to watch. Plus that division uh, uh, is is pretty good too. Right, ripe for movement, yeah. uh, as Absolutely. they say. So, uh, were there any other pitchers that uh, you wanted to talk about that are post uh, 200 ADP <laughs> that that Nick Pollock is looking at going? I don't know. I know. You keep I saying know. my name like that. It's so funny. I uh, I'm looking. This is the first time I'm really giving a hard look at NFBC ADP um, since the start of January. And there's a couple of things that really stick out to me. Is I mean, like 191 is Brian Wu right now, which is <sighs> he's 53rd starting pitcher. And I go, what? That's got to be better than that. Um, I like him more than Bryce Miller. Um, I think his. I think he's so talented. I mean, then again, Bryce Miller is like three picks earlier. But uh, oh, there's there's Billy Ober. He's the forty second off the board. That's fine. Okay, we're cool with that. I love him. Um, Shota Managa. I'm a huge fan. I see the min pick as one oh nine now, though. So that's not gonna that's that's gonna change. Uh, he's not gonna be under two hundred because, right. or he's not gonna be outside two hundred. Shota Managa. I I cannot express this enough. I I saw that the Yankees were out on Managa because they were worried about his fly balls and home runs, and and then they sent uh, Strowman. <laughs> drives drives me absolutely bonkers that they went and got Stroman instead of Shota for the same rate. And I mean, I think I think it makes sense for the Yankees, all that kind of stuff. Whatever, two years they're they're going to go for Sasaki next year because they missed out on Yamamoto, and they're not going to not get Sasaki. And that's just how that's going to be, um, unless the Dodgers do their thing again, and it's going to drive everyone up the wall. You know, the um, Yankees made an offer and he said no, and then they're like, "Wait a minute, you can't reject us. We reject you. We don't like you." <laughs> 
I'm like, that is that is New York City spin. Don't believe a second of that. Yeah, there it is. Um, but uh, but they said all this stuff about the home runs, and it's like, well, hold on a second. Imanaga, yes, he allowed more home runs than MPB, and that's kind of annoying, and he allows more fly balls. You want to know why he allows more fly balls? Because he has elite uh, IVB and he has elite VAA. And it's like, you don't really get guys like that. It doesn't matter. He throws it like 93, 94. This is like Nestor Cortez, but better when Nestor Cortez's fastball was dominating. Yeah. And then also has like three other pitches that you can man and he has super low walk rates with. And oh, right. He allowed him more home runs. Why? Because he was pitching around the zone and nibbling because it's Japan. It's more in your favor to do that. But here... It, it you don't get away with those low four seamers here you don't get away with middle away four seamers to right handers if you're a lefty you should be just throwing that thing upstairs forever and destroying batters and there's no way that like the cubs are going to not do that with them like you have to yep. and those home runs were being hit because it was lower but then the second goes up that means that the launch angle goes higher and then it becomes that thing too high, but actually being too high, not like the home run in Major League, like actually too high, and it's a it's a fly ball out now. Was that a Major League reference? Oh yes, nice. and I aged terribly that film, um, but I a lot of bad things looking back on it. But anyway, <laughs> Shota Minaga to me is just going to absolutely destroy. And at two thirteen, I see right now, it's just yep, I'm very much in on that. I'm curious about Brian Bayo because he improved his slider um in this in by the end of the year and if that's sweeper six around again he is a volume guy and my number one rule when it comes to trying to find your sp 15 or top 15 or top 20 starters like an sp one or two that has passed out of it is searching for the guys that have volume already built in and you have a floor that you're acceptable with like you think that i mean for example past guys are like Alcantara and Zach Wheeler and George Kirby are examples of guys that are outside of the top 20 starters getting drafted who had a, a lockdown for like 180 plus innings who are efficient enough to constantly see the sixth and do that and had upside for more um, that we could understand like we could grasp like okay right he throws super hard and his change of really good or his you know whatever that's how it was with Wheeler that's how it was with Alcantara that's how it was with Kirby and I say this every year is like, who are those guys? And Bayo kind of fits it a little bit because he has the opportunity. And to me, it's a sinker change of combination that works really well. He just needs to figure out that slider a bit better. It was coming together later in the year last year. That could happen. All this stuff about Pedro, Rob Silver put out a funny thing being like, he's working with Pedro. Like, That's what we said last year. Sure. And I, what do you know? He was better, <laughs> to be fair. Then, he worked with Pedro Martinez and then went to driveline. I'm like, oh, God, we got to draft this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah there it is. <laughs> um, Ryan Pepe is an interesting one going to Tampa Bay because the Dodgers have this weird thing of not throwing high fastballs. Oh, I don't Ryan get Pepe it. Up. Walker Bueller's fastball should be thrown upstairs and they don't do it. Bobby Miller is like a down and away guy. And I'm like, what are you doing? Bobby is Bobby is that one, by the way. Bobby is easily the Zach Wheeler, Alcantara, Kirby of this year. It's not yeah. even close to me. Uh, it's Bobby. Break up. Um, but I... I mean, he's it's getting, it's, it's, he's getting drafted. Like, oh, in he's the my fourth sleeper, round. but he is a sleeper because he's outside the top 20 starters. Like, he's at 22 right now. And I, I actually see Grayson Rodriguez at 19. I have rescinded this. Um, I, I talked about it on the on the post pitch this morning when I went over the Orioles. Like, Grayson Rodriguez's four seamer gets hit way too hard. And I can't allow yeah. that. Um, so, it's yeah. I, oof, sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no. You're right. Bringing up Grayson Rodriguez, like, like, if there was any can't miss pitching prospects and they're all miss, can miss pitching prospects, you know, from Honeycutt to Mize to whoever. But um, but uh, Grayson Rodriguez was, you know, the five-pitch mix guy that was going to come in and change the world. And <laughs> he, he did not perform well. But there is another guy. There is another guy. You're right? Tyler Wells. Oh, you want Tyler the Wells? Baltimore Tyler Orioles. Wells. Yeah. I have to hear – your take he on over Tyler before. Wells because oh. at ADP over 300, watch out, sleep, sleeper <laughs> alert. What do you think? I mean, I understand it, right? 118 innings. What was it like a 360 ERA and a 0.98 whip or something? Pretty good. You're not bad, right? Not um, bad. He overperformed a ton. His tipper nine was like six and change, which uh, to me, I don't really use like BABIP and stuff. To, like when we look at whip, the, the I only use it when it confirms my bias ah, that I want. Ah. 
it's it's really helpful because like I I think I, I certainly forget at times. Like whip is a really simple stat and it's just innings pitched. You gotta do that. Sure, whatever, fine. But really, it's like how many walks do you allow and how many hits do you allow? And we kind of overlook the whole hit aspect of it. We only look at like walk rate with it, but we just look at Babbitt for like hit stuff. Like, no, no, let's actually just see how many hits per nine does he allow. And you can get a grasp of generally when it comes to being an elite pitcher, being a great pitcher, being an average pitcher and being a bad pitcher. It's like the elites are the ones that are like seven or lower. The above average ones, the good ones are like seven and change. The average is like eight and change. And then the bad is when you get close to nine and seeing like a six and change from Tyler Wells. You're just like, no, sorry. No, especially with ICR and ICR to me is the, um, the best stat to look at when it comes to hit rates. Um, and, uh, when, it, when you're actually looking at contact, uh, it's not barrel rate. It's not hard hit rate. Uh, it's ICR rate, which is, uh, ideal contact, which actually makes all the sense. We have the data. Tom Tango is like, yo, I uh, sure. Yeah. Barrels are obviously a high expected batting average, but there's also like solid contact, which is just underneath the barrel, which is like a 65% chance of a hit. Oh, that is like a 65 batting average, right? Uh, 650. Um, I like to think of batting averages as percentages. I'm weird, but that's what they are. <laughs> uh, and then uh, you also have flares and burners, which are those little flares, those dunkers into the left field or the ones that are like scorched, you know, up the middle or whatever it is. And that's also 60%. And you take those three and then you look at the other three, which are like a weak contact and topped and under and that stuff. That's like 10%. So you look at all of the forms of contact and you're like, well, okay, yeah, those are the ones you want to induce and those are the ones you want to avoid. So you just group all the ones that are you want to avoid. That's ICR. And uh, ICR rates for Tyler Wells' fastball and his cutter were really bad. <laughs> those are not good. Uh, I I'm, I wish it were better. I wish I had better news. I actually was looking into it this morning feeling like, oh, cool, I'm going to like really like this. Nope, I'm not. And he's way too pedestrian. I uh, I think he squeezed the most he could last year. I think he got fatigued by the end of it. And I think the Orioles are going to, they haven't made a decision in my view. It's Means, it's um, it's Bradish, and it's Grayson as, the, as their three. Dean Kramer is still very much a starter to them. Uh, I don't like Dean Kramer at all. No, no. What? No. No, D Dean's the man. So underrated. He won like 15 games last year. The proof oh, no. is in the Dean pudding, as we say. <laughs> He's the schoolmaster, Dean Kramer. Come on, man. He's. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, well, of course, he benefits from having, you know, and Adley Rutschman was, uh, that, that was his first full year. Adley like, is great. Adley does. He's going to be really good. good uh, even better. He's going to help the pitchers. They all love him and trust him. And, you know, the team's awesome. So, yeah, I want to believe that. Unfortunately, Dean Kramer just has a good cutter and nothing else. Really, the fastball can get whiffs. He uses it two strikes sometimes and does, he does cool stuff with his hair, too. I think I, I don't know how that fits in on the PLV. That's probably more like yeah. down the trough. I'll talk to some bit. people, see if we can like get through, the, yeah, the dudes in there. Yeah, like at the casino, you've got like the bosses and then down the line, you've got the food and beverage guys, you know, oh like, <laughs> hey, we're all in this together, guys. Who's we're the chef together? Yeah. The um, casino. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Dean Kramer is very much involved in that. I, honestly, I think there are two more exciting guys for the Orioles. Uh, and that's the Ooh, their two prospects, tell. Cade Povich and Chase McDermott. Wow. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see them by in one of them by like May. Uh, I'd be intrigued on them. But there's a possibility that Wells returns to be a fireman or not. We don't know yet. We're going to see how spring shakes up. Um, and I, it's Cole Irvin and Bruce Zimmerman are like the fringe ones and there's no way. Cole so I would Irvin. expect Taylor Wells out of the gate and it's not terrible. It's just, I really think he's very, just very pedestrian. Um, and, and who were those he's two most out of it last year? And it's not going to repeat. Who were those two prospects that you just mentioned? Uh, that that just, you know, for prosperity's sake, you know, <laughs> uh, not because I have a pen in my hand. My paper. <laughs> I, yeah, you'll see them, of course. Uh, you'll see all these prospects of every team outlined inside of the top 300. I'll have a whole section for them. Um, also, if you guys want to see all the stuff for every team, you can check out the PL Pro Early Access. That's going on now. Um, and with Chase McDermott and Kate Povich, they both have good IVB four-seamers. Um, they both have a little question mark when it comes to command. But I, 
I believe with Chase McDermott, if I remember correctly, has uh, he's from the right side and uh, Povich is from the left. Uh, it's two good breaking balls with McDermott. Wow, it's a really good slide. No, really good curve for Povich. Um, they're all they're both very interesting. I'm just kind of curious how like their April AAA goes and how they look in the spring. Um, Povich also comes in at like 92 as opposed to like 94 um that uh mcdermott does which then makes him more interesting so i want chase mcdermott of the two it's just like a little bit better across the board um, ladies maybe, and gentlemen yeah. you heard it here first from the pitching guru <laughs> himself uh thank you for that uh nick those those gold those wonderful uh nuggets that you're so kind to put those oh, out come there on. but this of is, course we'll if, see if this turns into anything just so when they come up you're like oh cool i know him. oh great i don't want him on my team awesome <laughs> hey Nick, it's all good until it isn't. And right now it's all good. You know, we're all just having fun drafting. But uh, so that was Tyler Wells for the Baltimore Orioles. Nick mentioned two other guys to keep your eye on in those draft and hold, you know, 50 oh, round yeah. lates. Fun, yeah. yeah. To, when you're drafting like your fourth backup catcher, you know, Austin Hedges, uh, forget that. Just you know, listen, <laughs> listen to Nick. And, and oh, there is also DL Hall. I should mention. I did mention him this morning, but yes. they actually did suggest that they were going to try and stretch him out. I don't believe it. <laughs> I like this is this yeah. is like the AJ Puck situation. Fool me once. Yeah. Like they're like, no, can't, we want to try fool and me stretch again. AJ Puck out again. I'm like guys, stop this. These are lefties with a really good slider, and they don't have command enough. They uh, they're a two-pitch arm, and they are going to walk too many even doing that. And it's just no. No, no, no. No, no, no. And, um, Nick, we're running up on uh, up on an hour. But I wanted to ask you about I, – I can't, I can't let you leave. Like, literally. <laughs> I have no like intention child, leaving right now. Like, yeah, like Toys <laughs> R Us. Like, you're trying to get out, and I'm, like, holding on to your leg. Absolutely not. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the players that I really like is Drew Thorpe for the Padres. He came over in the Soto trade from uh, uh, the Yankees. Uh, ADP is around 400, so that sounds good to me. 23-year-old dominated high A and double A. Uh, the Padres rotation, their locks, of course, you've got Musgrove, Darvish, King, who also came over from the Yankees. And then, you know, Randy Vasquez and some a couple other people. Uh, of course, they have Robbie Snelling down there, but he's only 20. Um, so what do you think about Drew Thorpe? I, I kind of think he's going to make some starts for the Padres this year, and I think his changeup's ready. What what say you, uh, Mr. Nick? Oh, Hart? man, it's really tough because uh, I – okay, I don't really know a lot about double-A guys and lower. Um, it's really hard to, to really give a good assessment because – I need to see my AAA data. I need to see my stack has data to understand a little bit more about them. I need to see more video. Uh, I certainly will lean on a lot of other guys uh, for assessments on the guys like Drew Thorpe. Now, there is one rule that I have established. Oh, okay. And I, you heard me say it before with Gavin Stone. And if the best thing that a prospect has is a changeup, I'm out. I, oh, I do not like buying in on changeup focused starters. It's really rare in the major leagues to be a changeup first arm. The only one that I can really think of right now is Logan Webb. And then that's like the ceiling of it, right? Luis Castillo sure. was, but he also kind of had like, I don't know, like 98 miles per hour <laughs> and a yeah. good slider that he wasn't quite utilizing correctly. And then also he moved from a sinker to a four seamer and became the guy that he is now. And he even lost that changeup. Pablo Lopez didn't become Pablo Lopez until he went to drive line and learned the sweeper and gained velocity on the four seamer. Right. And he still has that changeup. I mean, he, he says the changeup is always there and it's this unbelievable weapon. But those other elements are what has turned him into a, a top five, six starter now. In yeah. Madison. So when it comes to prospects, I need to have a guy that is just drop everything and pick him up kind of ability, right? Yeah. I call it the shag rug that you have for every single rookie. It's, <laughs> a, it's a young man's floor. Right. That all of them are going to have more volatility than your standard starting pitcher. It's just what it is the first year. So for me to risk that shag rug, I need to have overwhelming electricity in your arsenal. And Drew Thorpe, to me, if you're a change of focus one, 
that doesn't seem like the kind of uh, approach that I generally lean on uh, for trusting young starters. So that's my take on it. I don't know though. I I have I generally say I will give you my appropriate opinion of a starter once they hit the major leagues. Then I can properly look at them and see how they deal with the major league pitching or hitting and what their approach is and all that kind of stuff. I used to completely just ignore them. And fortunately, we have more data that has allowed me to do more now. But uh, yeah, I'm not circling Drew Thorpe uh, in my leagues at all. All right. Fair enough. Uh, what about a, a, a major leaguer near and dear to my heart? Shout out Garrett Crochet from the Chicago oh. White Sox. Vol for life. Go big orange. My alma mater, <laughs> Garrett Crochet's alma mater. Ultra talented, 22, 24 years old. They might stretch them out. They yeah. might not. They might do whatever they need to do because they're the they're the White Sox. But I <laughs> think I, I think they're just going to be whatever because it's probably going to be a lost season. But I don't know. But Garrett Crochet was a first round pick in twenty twenty. This is kind of his year to kind of get something going. And he's young. Nobody likes the Chicago White Sox. I get it. But this is a talented pitcher. And whatever happens, uh, I think he's going to at least get a a shot at whatever that's going to be. What what do you think, Nick, when you see Garrett Crochet for the White Sox? Crochet is going to have to thread the needle if he's going to knit together a good uh, 2024. Um, his, uh, his slider is still great. And we love that after Tommy John. Of course, he had it after 2021, really in 2022. Uh, and we missed all of 2022. We saw like 13 innings last year. I I actually covered him this morning. This is great. You're asking me all these guys that are fresh on my mind. It's amazing, Brandon. Great minds think alike. So and that's so offensive to you. It's not because at you're, all. you're like, I'm, getting, you're like, like I'm talking the to the table, guy. Like, I gotta cover this team today. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I'm talking to the guy that went on and on about Reese's Pieces buttercups. Oh, like, stop. where did I go I wrong in my life? I don't, I don't like don't this. Know. I don't like self-deprecating humor because you're better. You're you're better than that thing you're 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 crafting right now. I don't like it. Don't talk negative of Brandon that way. Uh, but um, but yeah, Garrett, his fastball was really good back in 2021 ish, because it only had like a 10 percent swing strike rate, even though it had a good amount of movement and and velocity, and it's worse now, and that's a problem. Um, it's not the same overpowering pitch it was, and there's nothing else than that slider. Like this is a Wasker rule at at worst, or really at best. And a Wasker rule is you don't trust the pitcher who has just a good slider. That's the Wasker you know rule. Uh, who might come Wasker back to screw that? Kind of funny. Yeah, the Wasker you know. That's what I I did that in 2021 going to 2022, and I regretted it since. And I made it that rule. I learned my lesson. I uh, there were a lot of guys that year that actually had like a really good slider, and I was like, oh man, and he's got like good enough heat, and it's fine. Wasker you know had a terrible fastball shape, and it was a terrible pitch for him. And he had an amazing slider. And nope. Uh, Albert Alzale was also kind of in that realm at that time. Mm. Um, just for another name in that way, so you understand it. But yeah, he would be the same way, Gary Crochet. And I have no interest in him. So I'm really sorry, but I don't expect that to work out. All right, Garrett Crochet. Uh, Nick says you have some things to work on, and who better to work on it with you than the Chicago White Sox? <laughs> I'm sure that's going to work out. Great. Absolutely. They have like 14 starters to choose from. Yeah. Uh, it's did really they sign ridiculous. like Luke Weaver? Or I, I, don't, I don't know. What's did they do Luke Weaver? I, they, uh, Somebody Woodford, did. I, I assume it was the, um, Jared Woodford, otherwise is known as the Amish Mustang. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I. Uh, you have Chad Cool as well over there. Chad Cool, oh from the Rockies, that guy. Yeah, well, yeah, they the both of them are on minor league deals. Tuki Desant's there as well. Um, you cool have uh, Davis Martin at some point coming back, maybe from Tommy John. You got like Nick Nestrini from in, in oh. the minors. He was in the Lance Lynn deal uh, last year. You got Sean Burke. Like, there's so many random names that could just get oh, Sean Burke. Yeah, that's um, who amazing. had shoulder soreness last year. Um, yeah, there, there, there's Christian Mena, there's uh, Kai Bush. I just did this this morning. It's the only reason why I can name all of this. Uh, but all of these, it's just really Nick Nestrini who's the interesting one. And uh, Michael Kopech looks so not it. 
uh and he needs to get back to he lost like a, an inch and a half of vertical movement on his fastball it's like no dude that was already he, a problem with command yeah he 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 was he was a uh you know a uh a, a, a falling star you know a burn bright yeah and then it uh i don't know if we'll ever see it again i i, I wish him the best but you never know and uh, just real quick and i promise i'll let yeah, you know, real, take all the time quick, this is this is so fun this is great three draft targets and this is just me personally yeah, that i love tanner bybee gavin williams ryan pepio is there any of those three that you uh think could be an sp1 you know you you can you can draft any one of those guys maybe in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. Is there any one of those that has SP one potential? That's Tanner Bybee, Gavin Williams. I want you to tell Ryan. me, Brandon, why you like those guys. Uh, I like Tanner Bybee because I watched him uh, pitch. When I'm I'm from Jackson, Tennessee, which is a small town in between Nashville and Memphis. I didn't really, and I grew up in the '90s, and I didn't really have a baseball team. But when I first started playing. Uh, fantasy baseball it was in 2015 and a friend of mine that started a, a league in our office where I work he asked me to mm -hmm. be in it and I was like I know who Mike Trout is I don't I don't know who anybody else is that plays <laughs> baseball and he said no just do it and so I did it and then I got obsessed with it over the years but anyway so the first team somehow it worked out where I drafted this is in 2015 and it was all a fluke I didn't know who these players were sure, but yeah. it, it was uh Corey Kluber hmm it was Carlos Carrasco, yep. um, uh, Trevor uh, um, Richards. No, no, um, he, he's in the KBO. Disgraced. He was for. The oh no, yeah, don't, we don't mention him. That, that 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 guy, Danny Salazar. Oh yeah, and um, Got the entire Guardian staff. The entire Cle they were called the Indians back then, but they they were the entire Cleveland staff. And I believe that year in 2015. And again, this is just stumbling into it with using an ESPN top 300 mm -hmm. list as to draft from because I'd never drafted a, a fantasy baseball team. Anyway, so at night I would listen to um, the Guardian, the Cleveland Indians broadcasts. And it would be one of those five starting pitchers, especially Salazar. He was my favorite. Yeah, we but, all like know, that split change, and uh, that was – yeah. And he, injuries took his career away, unfortunately. Breaking ball but wasn't very good either. You, you know what happened with Carrasco. You know what happened with the other guy that will shall not yep. be named. But, you know, that was Kluber's – it was the year after he won the Cy Young, and he still had a sure, couple yeah. of good years. Ooh, Bobby. Anyway. So I developed the the guard the Cleveland Indians uh, uh, color guy the main guy I, has a very distinctive voice I can't remember mm -hmm. the gentleman's name but he's very well known so I have a long <laughs> story short of yeah. your story you have long story short I have a very soft spot in my heart for anything Cleveland Indians slash Guardians pitchers so Tanner Bybee you know his his I think he pitched 140 innings somewhere around there this year mm -hmm. looked great. Like a under four ERA, you know his whip was decent. Strikeout, uh, you know the K per nine, good. Like just everything looks good for Tanner Bybee. Plus, I'm a sucker for the the Tanners of the world. Uh, one of <laughs> one of my favorite pitchers was Tanner Burns. That he came in a few years ago uh, from Auburn with uh, with Mize a year or two after Mize. Unfortunately, that hadn't worked out. But Gavin Williams, another high upside pitcher that I like. And Ryan Pepio, I, I loved him with the Dodgers because team context and watching him pitch, basically two pitch guy, but who cares? So what? That's well, what the race like. Actually, yeah. The season went so the, those are my three guys. Do I, well, do I have if I any had to draft actual... one of those three at their ADP, it easily would be Pepio over 200. Really? Um, okay. Oh yeah. I, I mean, at least Pepio makes more idea. sense to me as like, he's going to Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay is one of those teams I circle. I was like, all right, you go there. You should be, you know, um, squeeze the best version of yourself. And the Dodgers didn't use his fastball correctly. I mean, he has actually good pitch shape on that four seamer that I thought wasn't going to be that good. And then I looked more into it. I'm like, wait, you're throwing it too low. <laughs> like this has to be, a, this is made to be a high four seamer. Um, if you don't have those kind of metrics on it, it's like, cool. If you have like cut on it, then like, okay, we throw it over here. We throw it inside the lefties. Or we uh, sometimes you want to if you have like a lot of IVB but you don't really have good angle on it like you know what let's actually make it a low called strike pitch 
Um, you have a lot of arm side movement and great, and then you throw it inside to righties. But he has one that's like, no, we would like to do the high thing and we can get whiffs there. I'm like, great, Pepio, do that, please. And I know the Rays will do that. Uh, and then the changeup that was like a Grady, a Grady, 80 grade. There we go. That's the phrase. 80 grade. It was Grady. Yeah. It was Grady. Aid Grady. <laughs> it got really Grady. <laughs> that good old Aid Grady. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm, I love my, uh, my love fried it. chicken with Grady. Love that Aid Grady. I uh, it's the Kool Aid Grady. That's <laughs> uh, he had that with the with the Dodgers. They didn't come up the first year. It was terrible. Like we came in the first year, it was like a fifty percent strike rate. He could not command this thing. All of a sudden, last year is when that happened. That's when he had his success. Obviously, he overperformed. High left and base rate, all that kind of stuff. Sure, but there is actually some good skill in there, and I would love to see that on that winning ball club. It might be like five innings and in dive, but that could be very valuable for you while Bybee and in Williams, I found myself disliking more and more. Um, Bybee has a slider and change up that are both good. And he can actually kind of do the Carrasco mold Four seamer. No four seamer is not a good pitch. He's trying to do the whole, the whole stay Verde, throw it upstairs, get the IV, all that stuff. He's, it's just not, it's not what he wants it to be. It's going to be sub 10% swing strike rates or like 12% at best or something like this is not that pitch and he's trying to force it and it's not going to be there. Sometimes the curve is there to help out, but really this is about the slider and the change up. The slider is really good. He doesn't command it that well. And the change up floats too. And I feel like both of them overperformed last year. And it makes me a little scared about Bybee because I don't actually believe in his fastball and I don't know how good the secondaries are going to be to really keep him afloat so it's kind of like a carrasco thing um while gavin williams i was more in on because the general assessment by gavin williams was big overpowering fastball this is a guy that the ship could be throwing up her 90s and just like boom there it is destruction you know and then okay we just need to get those curveballs and sliders for strikes and whatever what i realized is that that four seamer wasn't as good as i wanted it to be and there were days that the curveball actually was doing what it wanted to do down. And that's like that 12 strikeout game against the Jays yeah. uh, out of nowhere, where I remember putting him as a do not start on my daily streaming ranks. <laughs> and because it was just like, he's just been so bad and the Jays are great. And like, I don't want to take this risk. Yeah. And everyone was like, I can't believe that you probably put him. I'm like, all right, man, I'm sorry. I didn't expect him to do this. It was not a high probability thing. It was very likely he was going to hurt you. So I, yep. of course, scarred that in my mind forever. Um, I love that from Gavin Williams when he can do that. He just did it so, so rarely. And without the four-seamer being as overpowering and bullying as we want it to be, I'm a little tepid um, at his current price, which is actually 168 as the 44th starter off the board. But Not I'm bad. seeing like Mitch Keller, I actually am a little more encouraged by. Um, I think, uh, oof, this is interesting. It's a very interesting crew because I'm seeing this is from uh, from ADP since the start of January. Um, I see Shane Bieber at 43, which I just think is too generous, even though I'm the kind of person that's like, maybe actually there is room for him to improve. I like can't do it at 43. Yeah. Uh, Gavin Williams is a 44. Mitch Keller is a 45. That's Carlos Rodon and Jose Barrios, Christian Javier, Nick Pavetta, Bryce Miller, Shane Boz, and uh, Eduardo Rodriguez, Brian Wu. It's like, this is a mix of of your risky guys and who I think are more stable. So like Bryce Miller and Brian Wu, I would take all day over Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee. And Tanner Bybee is going ahead of like Sonny Gray. And I'm like, Sonny Gray is just, why, why do you, Tanner Bybee wants to be Sonny Gray. <laughs> yeah. Like just take Sonny Gray. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh man, I, I don't know. Yeah, no way. Hunter Green's at 37 because everyone wants strikeouts in NFBC, but they don't realize like he's Where, where's cole team. reagan's uh oh, cole in, Reagan in that is, mix 29 is at one 112 he's he's like uh four spots above tanner bybee and i i i'm telling you right now if you take tanner bybee instead of cole reagan's <laughs> no don't talk to me nick I mean, will I come joe find right you tanner bybee all day joe musgrove like again tanner bybee hopes to be joe musgrove so dylan sees is at 30 no oh gosh oh oh this is painful. Why'd you? Oh, God. Nick is having a physical reaction to the Dylan Cease ADP. The... <laughs> no. No, y'all. No, his fastball has too much cut action. It doesn't, it's not going to get the whiffs that it wants, the stuff plus. Who cares? It doesn't. No, uh, it's not it. It's not it. 
and it's just a slider, and the slider was way worse last year uh, against uh, right-handers, and the fastball was way worse against left-handers, and that's all he has. What a fall from grace for Dylan Cease. Well, it was uh, a lovely peak. You know, instead of it being, you know, like, oh, this is, you are a celebrity. It's just kind of like, well, hey, man, you're cool for a moment. And like, that's that. Yeah, kind of like an Alec Manoa situation. Hey, oh, gosh. One, one, one shining. You were you were top three in Cy Young one year. And oh, then, man. you know, who knows where you are now. But, I, you know, so not to make light of me. Yeah, not to make Manoa light of could Alec get it Manoa back. Situation. Manoa yeah. legitimately could get it back. Now, I, I think it's more of a mental thing than anything yeah. else at this point. And that's like, well, all right, I can't really help you there. But um, his, it was legit. Like his, I think his swing strike rate on his four seamer to right handers. Um, I try to know it's like so many different qualifiers, but just think of it like, uh, you know, this is his, his best pitch against right handers. He had a swing strike rate of 20% in 2022. Like that is super legit. Oh, uh, Alec Manoa, uh, Manoa had a, uh, you know, a Lance Lynn thing going for him there, you know, had that no kind way. of bulldog, big guy. Oh, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm I'm going to chew you up and spit you out uh, kind of kind of attitude. And it just got derailed because of personal issues and things that I will never know or completely understand. But, yeah, you know, that's life. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. It's. Man, it was so ridiculous. I remember last year we we're talking about it. It was like we we're debating oh Alec Manoa or or Kevin Gosman, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in an auto new league, which is like a keeper slash, you know, uh, uh, every every player has a money value and and mm -hmm. I traded for Alec Manoa and then I I I take some personal responsibility because I traded for him and it just kind of went downhill after that. But man uh, it is you know, shocking how like he can come back. He can come back. They're they're leaving the door open for him in Toronto. So I I hope it gets worked out. We'll see. I, but I'm just looking at it more here really quickly. Of like against right-handers, the biggest change, honestly, he still had like 17% swing strike rate against right-handers last year. He was down a tick in velocity. His ICR rates were elite before. It was like 33%. If that's on a four seamer, if you see a four seamer underneath 35%, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, kiss. I'm always like normal to like 38%. That's what I normally see. So it's 40% or higher. I'm like, um, and then it gets then like when you know it's a detriment, it's above 45. It was 33% for both 21 and 22 for Alec Manoa against right handers, and all of a sudden 52% just like that. I mean, it was a smaller sample of 150 pitches as opposed to like 430. Um, and only 43, actually, I'm even like 32. Nope, 28, uh, 28 balls in play. Um, so it's a really small sample. Um, and he might have just gotten really unlucky with that. Uh against left-handers. I I got I gotta see this quickly because this is like oh yeah, the four seamer got a lot worse against left-handers too. It was always kind of bad. Against oh yeah, why are you throwing that sinker against lefties? What are you doing? That was a terrible oh my gosh. 33% ICR to 57% last year. So I mean that there's your problem. Uh why? I don't know. <laughs> It's, Figure fix it out. it's fixable. L ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. Ugh. Nick Pollock says Alec Manoa is primed for a big comeback season. Okay, all right. Okay, Alan, you know, uh, Mr. Really? Alan here. We were doing so well. Am I misrepresenting <laughs> the facts? Well, let's not let let's not let the facts get in the way of a good, ah. you know, podcast. So Nick. Uh, Pollock, thank you so much uh, for being on. I absolutely love talking to you about pitching. I could talk, I could, listening to you talk about pitching is like listening to Picasso talk about painting. Don't, okay, it, I'm not it, it is, it is no, fascinating. No, 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 I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not I, sure I understand, but I know no. it's good. It's like Mr. Burns <laughs> and The Simpsons. I don't know what good art is, but I don't hate that. You know, <laughs> that's his sure favorite. I, Alquinoa's slider also was so much worse. Uh, that was a big issue against lefties. There you go. There, there's yeah. the Alquinoa problems. Okay, so Nick is a tough critic, but I'm pretty sure he liked two pitchers we discussed tonight. Oh, yeah. No, One we, is we Christopher got... Sanchez no. for the Phillies, and the other uh, is Ryan Pepio for the Rays. I said uh, I liked it more than uh, than Williams and, and Bybee at the price. I don't know if I'm necessarily going to go after it because you have Wu and Bryce Miller that are like 10 picks. Oh, yeah. Brian I would Wu. much rather have like Brian Wu. Is there anything oh. better than a Wu girl uh, or a Wu girl crew? 
in, a, in a Nashville oh, uh, bachelorette party. No such thing. Nothing. Nothing gets better than the Woo Girls on a bachelorette party. So. I mean, I think there are some, but uh, I am very happy to call myself a Woo Girl this year. I'll be happy I, with that. I, I love the Woo Girls. I'm, I'm all for Brian uh, Woo for the 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 Mariners, but I would really love it if everyone would tune in to PitchCon. Please go to PitcherList.com for all the information it's for a good cause and if you're like me some good karma is definitely a good thing so it's for a good cause nick and um, all these other great baseball analysts are going to be on there it's free you don't have to donate please go check out pitchcon at pitcherlist.com to get all the information nick what is going on did we oh. actually finish the podcast? Yeah, it actually says recording and everything. <laughs> this is amazing. Look, and if you guys are listening right now and you haven't reviewed this show, what are you doing? Help these oh, guys oh, out. Been yeah. So much hard work for this. That's right. Uh, Please go. Uh, uh, oh, oh, it's over here. Rate and review it. That would make Michael Govier happy. He sternly, <laughs> hey! he sternly told me to put the the borders on and all this. It was a very passive aggressive uh, text <laughs> he sent me from last time but that's okay i do need some direction when it comes to this podcasting business but i had a great time nick i can't tell you awesome. a, a, enough how much i appreciate it you're taking time uh to to come on the podcast no, and talk baseball pleasure's all mine thank you so much i will not forget it no, no really thank you so much for having me uh and uh yeah you're really good at this this is great uh well, thanks so much for you, are, you are too kind i am going to hit in recording and i think that's it for the night thank you take Nick. care y'all